making money on the move. It's mobile home investing. Sponsorship of the Military Money Show is provided by Navy Federal Credit Union. The holidays have passed. It's time to get focused on your finances for the new year. Navy Federal Credit Union offers multiple savings and investing options to help you get closer to your financial goals. Their digital tools and educational resources can help guide your decisions. Plus, with Navy Fed, you can automate your savings and investing, putting your money to work while you sleep. You can learn more at NavyFederal.org. Hey, welcome to the Military Money Show, where I help the military community make, save, and invest money wisely. I'm your host, Lacey Langford, the Military Money Expert. There's more to real estate investing than you think. Did you know that you can invest in mobile homes? I didn't. In this episode, we talk about what mobile home investing is and how to invest in them. My guest, Rachel Hernandez, is an author, Air Force, mill spouse, and real estate investor. As a former business-to-business sales executive for various Fortune 500 companies, Rachel has extensive training in the area of sales and marketing. With over a decade of experience, she spent several years as a landlord before taking the leap to specializing in mobile home investing. She's the author of Adventures in Mobile Homes, How I Got Started in Mobile Home Investing and How You Can Too, and the Real Estate Investing Sucks series of books. Rachel breaks down what investing in mobile homes looks like, how it's different from traditional real estate investing, and tips on how you can get started. Here is my chat with Rachel. Hey, Rachel, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here. Hi, Lacey. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I think this is going to be a fun conversation. It's a new topic for me. So I'm thinking a lot of people listening, this is going to be a new topic for you. So I want to start at the basics because I did a little bit of homework on this before recording with you. And I think there can be some confusing things about mobile home investing. So what exactly is mobile home investing? Well, there's a different couple different pieces that go with mobile home investing. The difference between mobile home investing and traditional real estate investing is that these mobile homes are mobile. So basically, a manufactured home or mobile home, you can actually set it at a location and then move that to another location if you want in the future. Compare that to traditional real estate investing with an apartment building, single family home or a duplex or a townhome. You can't really move it because it's got that foundation that it's laid on. So that's the main thing about mobile home investing is that these homes are mobile and can be moved if you want in the future. The other thing about mobile home investing is there's two ways to look at it. You can buy the home itself as personal property not attached to land, and that is taxed just kind of like a car as personal property. And the good thing about that is usually if it's taxed like a car, the taxes go down every year, actually, because it's seen as a depreciating asset. But if you're actually getting cash flow from that home, then it depends on how you see it. For me, it's an asset, even though the county or my tax assessor may see it as a depreciating asset. So that's the home itself not attached to land. Or you can attach the home to a piece of land or a lot, and that will be seen as real property. So basically, you're getting taxed on the home and also the lot or the piece of land together. So you have options. So the main thing with mobile home investing is that you have options. You're not cornered into one location. You can always move that home to another location. And then also the way the home is taxed. It can be taxed as personal property, just the home itself, if that's what you bought. Or if you own the lot and the land, you can attach the mobile home if you also own that as real property. So those are the two main things when it comes to mobile home investing. Do most of the time when people invest this way, are they getting just the mobile home or is it more popular that you get the property and the mobile home? 
honestly, it depends on the investor. But for me, I focus on just the mobile home itself as personal property, not attached to land or a lot. So what most people do, they just follow the system of Lonnie Scruggs, who's actually the godfather of mobile home investing. And he wrote a book, Deals on Wheels. He was my personal mentor. He would buy the homes in the parks, just the homes in these manufactured home communities. And then he would work with the park manager or the owner of the community to allow him to sell these homes in their community. So those buyers end up buying from him the home, but they're still renting the lot, that piece of land where the home is in the mobile home community, because he didn't own the land. He only owned the home and he would owner finance that. So basically people would come and give him a down payment and monthly payments over a period of time. So that's the starting point, what most people do. Then what Lonnie did is after he bought the homes, he actually started buying lots like the land and the home and piecing it together. So he would get owner financing from the land and also the manufactured home as well, too. So he's getting double payments, double the cash flow. But for the most part, like me, most people just start out with the homes itself in these mobile home communities, in these mobile home parks. And then once they get enough experience, then they may go out and buy a mobile home on a piece of land or buy individual lots. Well, if you are buying, let's say there is a mobile home park near me and I want to buy the whole mobile home park. So I'm getting the land and all the mobile homes on it. I'm now a landlord though, right? Because I own the property and I can raise the rent prices, right? Yes. Yes. So to me, that's a lot more management. (laughs) Yes. And I did ask Lonnie Scruggs, he never bought a mobile home park himself. I actually talk about this in my podcast, Adventures in Mobile Homes, my podcast. It's called The Truth About Mobile Home Parks. There's more than meets the eye when you are buying the entire park. Because Lonnie had told me, if you buy the entire park, you're in a different business. You're not in the owner financing business. You are in the management business. So meaning you've got to manage all these people. If there's a big expense that comes up, I've met several investors who've actually bought entire mobile home parks and they've just gotten so, oh my goodness, overwhelmed with the amount of expenses they didn't know. I knew an investor out of California, he had to refinance his single family homes to pay for a sewer mainline that broke in one of his mobile home parks, cost him $60,000. Oh, wow. After that, he fixed up the park a little bit, sold the park and just got out of it and went back into single family home investing. I had actually asked Lonnie Scruggs, so why didn't you buy a mobile home park? Besides the management, he said he wanted the freedom to go out and travel the United States in an RV with his wife. And he could do that just buying individual small mobile homes and small lots because he was just kind of owner financing them. And he was the bank, basically. As an entire mobile home park, if he bought that, he wouldn't be able to have that freedom because he'd be managing people. He'd be up at night worrying if there's going to be a large expense, a tree falls on a home and they don't have insurance. So he just didn't want to deal with all that. But that's a good distinction to make going into it is that it's a different ball game if you are buying the land, the whole park, and you're managing people versus you buy a home, you sell it to somebody. Exactly, exactly. And most people, they have the the shiny object syndrome. They think like, if I buy a park, then I get more cash flow because I don't even have to worry about the homes and I get lot rents. It's not really that way. And the people are actually teaching buying mobile home parks, entire mobile home parks. A lot of them actually had a lot of cash before they even bought these mobile home parks. I'm talking millions of dollars. (laughs) So it does take some money and capital and time. And it's just up to the individual investor if they actually want to give up that time. Because, you know, for me, I did it so that I can have the freedom to do the things I want to do, not have to do. And I'm not willing to give up years of my life to manage this park. I did know Lonnie Scruggs, one of his mentees who was doing the individual mobile homes. After he did about 50 of them, he actually went into mobile home park investing. He had to move his entire family to another state. And then they lived outside 
outside the mobile home park. He was there all the time. He was getting paid some kind of salary, but it was his family that suffered. So he ended up getting out of that business because he was in a partnership selling his share of that partnership. And then he went into something else. I think he went into self-storage, which is different because you're not dealing with people. You're just dealing with people's items. So, yeah. And now he's just happier doing that versus being, he thought like having a part would be great, but it wasn't. When you are looking to buy an investment property, is this something that you fix up or are you looking for something turnkey? Is it similar to buying traditional real estate? If you get something and fix it up, you can maybe pay less for it, sell it for more. For me personally, I am not in the rehabbing business. Now I have replaced roofs, but when I buy them initially, I really vet the people I'm actually dealing with. I work with just individual sellers who've been in these mobile home communities for about five to 10 years. Most of the time, if they've been in a community that long, they've already taken care of the property versus others who are there for like a couple of years. They may not take good care of the property. I'm, I'm, that's just a generalization, but this is basically what I've seen being out in the field. I'm just looking for cosmetics. So of course, if the carpet needs to be replaced, it needs new flooring. If there's a leak in the roof, that's fine. If the hot water heater needs to be changed out, just you know, paint, just cosmetic issues, remove and replace. Now, if the whole subfloor is gone and there are holes, because some of these manufactured homes, the subfloor is actually made out of particle board. They don't do the newer ones now, but the older ones, I knew an investor, he bought it, but he was spending so much time fixing it up. It had holes all over the home. And he was like, well, I'll just do it on my off time because he actually worked for the park as a maintenance person and he was just fixing it up on his off time. But that could take forever. And then at the same time, you're paying the lot rent on the home. And I will say the lot rent is basically to have the home on that specific piece of land. You have to pay the landowner. It's called a lot rent if you're renting that piece of land for the manufactured home to be on. And that is usually in a manufactured home community or an individual lot. Is that something you factor into your calculation when buying it? If it's a more expensive lot rent compared to the home, like is that something you weigh? Yeah, it is. But for me, I'm actually more concerned with the community. There's three different types of manufactured home communities. So you've got your low end, middle of the road, and then your high end community. And I'll tell you, I've done all of them. And I really thought that I could actually do like the lower end, middle of the road. Most investors do that to be able to get some of these homes less. But I just found that the type of clientele that these communities attracted and also the management as well, too, it didn't fit with my personality. So I actually ended up working more with higher end parks. I work in four or five star parks that are corporate owned. I do have a corporate background. So just the way they do business and the way they communicate just meshes well with my personality and how I do things and also my comfort level. So yes, the lot rent is more. I'm we're talking about five, six hundred dollars. I'm based in Texas compared to maybe a lower end or a middle of the road type park that may be like three, two fifty, something like that. So it depends on the investor. I would say just build your business around you and just don't focus on numbers because a lot of people just starting out, they tend to do that. And I understand resources are low. But maybe you need to check out these parks and find those that work well with your personality before diving into a quote unquote deal. That's a good distinction to make, though, the different areas that mobile homes are in to understand the playing field. So you know where you want to play on the field as an investor. Exactly. So it's different for everyone. Yes. Just for clarification, because I feel like everybody, when you say mobile home investing, everybody's thinking of an RV. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that, that was, you know, when I first heard of this, like people thought that. So that is something separate, correct? Yes. And that would be like an RV. Now they could also be thinking about those bullet mobile homes as well too. Yes. Okay. The old versions. Usually they're called trailer parks and those are allowed. The wheels are still on them. 
For me, I deal with mobile homes, manufactured housing that you actually have to, once it gets to the location from the manufacturer, you have to set it, meaning you have to install it. Usually they are on cinder blocks and then you remove the wheels move the axles and then remove the hitch that's in the front that is attached to the tow truck that the mover uses. So these are pretty much set. And that's pretty much what I do, the manufacturer and the mobile homes. In terms of travel trailers and RVs, there are RV parks out there, and that's a completely separate and different investing style. And I have not delved into that. I'm glad I asked that question because the terminology to get it right is important. A mobile home park versus a trailer park where they're still on their wheels, they can pull them in, pull them out very easily versus a mobile home park where they are set and not as easily moved. That's the part that gets me about the investing, I guess, is that if somebody bought a home, would you do that? Or that probably wouldn't be a good investment is to buy a mobile home and then maybe not like the community it's in and then move it. But that would be a huge expense, right? To move it. Yes. And there have been some, and I have moved homes several times from different communities, just because where the home is, I just don't feel comfortable in that community. It just doesn't work with my personality or the management. I just don't get along with the management because of personality issues. But there have been people who actually like, I don't want to live in this community anymore. Most of the time, it's because they already have a piece of land that they're buying. So they're moving that home to a piece of land or a lot. But sometimes they will move their existing home to another community. And what these communities offer are incentives. So if they've got vacant lots, some communities, and they've done it for me, they pay moving costs. They pay hookups, like, you know, your water, sewer, they pay everything. You know, it depends on the community. And if they really want to fill those lots, because once they're filled, they know that they can be just getting lot rent. It's kind of an incentive. Some communities will offer six months lot rent for free until you've got the home in there and you're you're already set up, but it'll be six months of free lot rent. So if lot rent's like $500 a month, I mean, that's like $3,000 worth of free lot rent for six months if they give that to you. So there are incentives. You just have to ask the community as well, too. I have two questions, but I'm already seeing that you've been answering them is comparing mobile home investing to traditional investing in the stock market and comparing it to real estate investing. Something you just said is, the management. I never really even thought about that, but that's similar to investing in a stock. If a company is running something into the ground, the way they're managing it, you have to pay attention before you buy a stock. And then also in real estate, if a seller's trying to sell their home, they could be offering closing costs, those type of things as incentives to get somebody to buy their house. So I, that's two things where they're similar. Are there some other things that are completely different for investing in stock versus mobile homes and traditional real estate? Yes. One of the things that makes mobile home investing unique within real estate investing, because it's actually a sub niche of real estate investing, is that there's one more extra step. This makes it harder, which means there's less competition, because in order to actually buy these homes in these communities, in these parks, you need to get approval from the park manager or the owner to work there. The park manager manages the entire park. The park owner owns the park. So usually you're dealing with the park managers because the owners have the managers manage the park. So you need to have their okay that you can actually do business in that park like what Lonnie Scruggs did as an investor, buy and sell these homes. So it takes some time to actually get to know these managers. You have to go in there, talk to them. There's a technique on how you do it. It's more of an art than an exact science. So it's really how you say things. Most of these managers, they do not want to be talking to someone who comes in and says, oh, I buy mobile homes and I'm an investor and I have all this money. And I've been in the office with the managers in the past that I've had relationships with. And we're talking and some investor comes in, starts talking, rambling, interrupts our conversation 
And the manager is like, okay, well, yeah, they just take their information and then they just throw it out and they just start rolling their eyes. <laughs> so yeah. there is that one additional step that you need to get the approval because it's their land. It's not yours. You're thinking about buying homes in their park on their land. So they really need to feel comfortable working with you on a business relationship. So that's the main difference. That is interesting to really think about the personalities. And I could see that if the manager isn't very helpful, <laughs> fun to talk to, mm-hmm. or kind, that could be a real turnoff on wanting to do business there. So I think that's something to have on people's radar. You started out doing this at some point. You know, you had to learn. Did you start doing this while your was it your husband on active duty? So the story is he was in the Air Force. And he got the HPSP scholarship. So basically, he was admitted into the Air Force. The Air Force paid for medical school, but he had to pay back with service. He was based in medical school in Phoenix, Arizona. And then for residency, he had to go to Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland, Washington, D.C. area. So for us, in the beginning, he started reading about Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and Robert Kiyosaki way back in medical school. I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I really didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. So I was a philosophy major. So what can you do with that? But my background was actually in marketing and sales. I did business to business sales for Fortune 500 corporations while in Arizona. So I had that background already. Like I'm very outgoing, outspoken, but I have that corporate background. And so it was his idea to get into real estate investing. Basically, we finished medical school in Arizona. We move, you know how it is. We yeah. move to uh, Maryland at Andrews Air Force Base. He does his residency. And as a physician, I hardly ever saw him because he's always in the hospital. You know, those residency years are the toughest. <laughs> so while he was doing that, I was just figuring out, you know, what should I do with the real estate? And my thinking when we got there was that I'm just going to go get a job. I applied to all these positions. Coca-Cola wanted to hire me as an account executive. And my husband's like, no, 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 no. Remember what we talked about real estate investing. (laughs) I had some money saved up from being a sales executive. And then he had money coming in from the Air Force. So the plan was for me to just get the experience, start real estate investing. So I started out in single family homes And I was a bird dog first looking for deals for other investors in the Washington, D.C. area. So basically what a bird dog is, is they actually work for investors, get the information. The investors have their criteria of what they want to buy, what location, how much they want to spend. Do they want to buy a single family home, apartment building, whatever the asset class of that piece of real estate As a bird dog, you get all that information, you talk to the seller, and then if they do want to sell, you pass that information to the investor. The investor takes it from there, negotiates a deal, and once they close on the deal, then you get paid as a bird dog. If you get paid as a bird dog, it's like a couple hundred dollars per deal. So I did that for a while just to build up cash and get experience, get to know the markets. And then after that, I became a wholesaler. So after wholesaling, what basically wholesaling is, is the same thing as a bird dog. You're working with these investors. And most of the investors I worked with are either landlords or they were buy and hold, buy and fix up rehabbers. And they just wanted to buy property, but they just didn't have the time to find these pieces of property. So they would tell me their criteria. So I would take all the information, talk to the seller, put it under contract as if I'm going to buy it, and then assign my interest to the end buyer, usually the investor, for a fee. And then I made money on the spread. So if I put the home under contract for 100000 and then my buyer was willing to pay 140,000 for a property i bought him i would assign it for 40,000 make 40,000 and then he would buy it for 140,000 that would all be with the title company the closing and all that the difference between bird dog and wholesaling is that you get paid a couple hundred dollars as a bird dog compared to wholesaling which is a couple thousand dollars 
it's a big difference. So I did that for a while. And then once we built up enough cash, we were able to buy single family homes for buy and hold as a landlord. And so we rented out these homes. I even brought in property management, but then it came time for my husband's obligation. He was done with residency. Okay, where are you going to go now? Guess what? He's going to Korea on an unaccompanied tour for a whole year. They based him in Kunsan, South Korea, which was an awesome experience for him. And I actually got to visit. But at that point, it was kind of like, do you want to continue doing the single family? And I just did it because every month that income, that cash flow, it went towards the mortgage. It went towards homeowners association. It went towards the property management. It was just eating it out. So We decided to sell our entire real estate portfolio, all of those single family homes and just cash out entirely. So he went and then before he went, he was kind of like, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to stay here? Do you want to go to back to California? Because our both of our families are there. I'm like, I'm not going back to California. I don't want to go there. It's too crowded. There's too many people. I'm stressed out. I get road rage when I when I go back to California. So I figured on Texas. We didn't know anyone here. We don't have any family. I checked out different cities and then I just kind of settled on San Antonio area. While he was in Kunsan Air Force Base all the way in Korea, I was just trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to do with this real estate business? So we basically, we cashed out. We had a whole bunch of cash from the single family homes. (laughs) I think I had like $200,000 worth of cash in our bank account. It was kind of like, what are you going to do with this cash? I didn't want to do anything hasty. So I was thinking, should I do apartment building? Should I duplexes, single family homes? And then it came up into mobile home investing. He had read about it a couple of years back while we were in DC. I tried it out. I just found a park manager, like you said, different personalities. I found a seller who wanted to sell me a home for $3,000 in the Washington, D.C. area. But then the park manager was kind of like, you can buy it if you live in this park. But if you're not going to live here, you can't buy it and (laughs) and then do the owner finance. And so I was like, oh, my goodness. So I got turned off. But once I got to Texas, I started really like honing in. Let me learn this again. And then I started into mobile home investing. And that was, I think, in 2007. So I've been doing mobile home investing for over a decade and then real estate investing for more than (laughs) that now, too. And then my husband, after his obligation in Korea, then he still had to pay back, you know, the military for the school. Then he was stationed in Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany, which was very nice. I bet. (laughs) Yeah. So like we were apart for like four years and a lot of our friends and even like my family, they didn't think we'd make it. (laughs) No, I'm not kidding. I believe you. I know. I believe you. I'm laughing because I believe you. I remember my dad, he's like, if things don't work out with your marriage, you can just work at Best Buy and live at home in Orange County with those. (laughs) That is not an option. (laughs) (laughs) No, it was not. It was not an option. I mean, it was really hard. I think it was harder on him because he's an introvert. I'm an extrovert. When I came here, well, actually, before I came here, I put together a women's group. Believe it or not, I actually put together a women's group online through Craigslist a professional women's group. And then before I came here, we had like our first meeting, we met at a restaurant just to kind of hang out and get to know people. So I'm very, very, very social. So I think it was harder for him than it was for me, but we got through it. We got through four years being apart, Korea, one year, three years, Germany. I got to see Paris. I mean, the, the military is great because it gives you a chance to see other places. I'm really thankful for the military for that. And also the service that people have. I mean, it's in Texas. This is like one of the places it's always like, thank you for your service. Thank Mm -hmm. you for your service. They're Air Force strong in San Antonio. Yeah, (laughs) right, right, right. You go to Home Depot, you go to the movie theaters, and then you get that military discount. And they're like, thank you for your service, you know. So I'm, I'm really thankful for that experience. But I think it was towards the end, they actually sent him to Iraq. They were sending all the physicians. So eventually, he probably would have had to go to Afghanistan, but he was in Iraq and then they extended it. So he was there for almost a year in Iraq. And it was really scary for me as a spouse and his family too. 
after that experience, he finished his obligation. He's like, I just want to get out because I just don't want something to happen to me. And then you're left here alone in the world, even though, you know, I have family and friends and he has family that would take care of me, but still just that possibility of losing his life. He didn't feel good about after Iraq, you know, so he got out and then he came here to Texas. Now he's out. He's a veteran. Now he just works from home. He just does consulting to hospitals part time and he's he's happy. That's what it's all about. That It sounds like you guys really worked as a team, though, and had a clear plan. Maybe not all the finer details worked out every second of the way, but it sounds like you guys were working together to reach your goals. Your knowledge of the playing field is very impressive. I think that's half the game of whatever business you're in is understanding the playing field and where you, you know how you can be an investor in this real estate world. How did you learn all of this? Were you reading books when you first started out in single family homes? I love that you went through the life cycle, like being the bird dog, doing wholesaling, doing the single family homes now with mobile home investing. Like I'm sure all that experience plays into all of it. Where did you start? Well, it was first the books. And then since I'm an extrovert, I went to my local real estate investment clubs I started meeting other investors, and I actually was mentored by the president of the Real Estate Investment Club when we were over there on the East Coast in the Washington, D.C. area. He was my mentor. From there, I actually also got another mentor who mentored me on wholesaling. So I've always had a mentor. And then Lonnie Scruggs was my mentor for mobile home investing. But I also had a local mentor here in Texas. I met her at a real estate conference and we both had a corporate background. She mentored me. And then Lonnie Scruggs mentee who did those 50 deals and bought the mobile home park. He mentored me as well. And then I went to a real estate conference here in Texas. I got like a regional mentor and he was based out of Houston. So I've always had mentors and I think it's important. I know it's hard, you know, with the military moving and PCSing all the time. Now we've got tools, we've got Zoom, we've got, <laughs> we've got, e- we still have email. We still can do the face-to-face even though we can't be there live in person, but we still have the virtual option. Try to get the support that you can and the help that you can. I've always surrounded people who know more than me in anything that I want to learn about. So I think that really is the key to my success, just having that support and having people around me who know more than me and have the experience. And also the support from my husband too. He was a key player in let's do this, but you're really the one that has to do this because you're the extrovert. <laughs> so yes. Everybody has their personalities for their skill set. For people that want to start out, what are a couple of things they should avoid? Mistakes that commonly happen if they're trying to get into mobile home investing or just real estate investing in general, I guess. Well, one of the things that they want to do first, because you know, personal finance is important, is to get their personal finances in order first. Because I don't suggest people to start investing if you've got a bunch of debt, like high interest debt, like credit card debt. Work your way to pay off what you need if it is high interest. And I'm sure, Lacey, you can help military folks with that if they need help in that area for personal finance. Get your personal finances in order first. Then when you're at the point where like, I feel pretty comfortable, I've got extra money here saved for investing. I've got some extra money coming in every month that I set aside for investing. Then you can be at the point where, okay, I'm going to look into maybe real estate investing or mobile home investing. When you're at that point, then what I suggest is read books on the subject Lonnie Scruggs, Deals on Wheels, we had mentioned that. And I'm sure you'll put that in the um, show notes. And then also I have a book, Adventures in Mobile Homes as well too. This is basically 
how I got started on a mobile home investing and what worked for me and what didn't work. I took Lonnie Scruggs formula and his expertise and his tips. I did all the stuff that he told me to do in his book, Deals on Wheels, but some things worked and some things didn't. So it's really my experience. And I'm sure, Lacey, you can put that in the show notes as well, too. My book is called Adventures in Mobile Homes. Read books on mobile home investing first. Also listen to podcasts like this. I also have a podcast, Adventures in Mobile Homes. But once you've got that point where, okay, I've got the information here, now what? Well, next you're going to have to make a plan. There's two paths. Either A, you have to build up cash as what I did when I first got started in real estate investing. That's We talked about the bird dog or the wholesaling because you don't have enough cash right now to start buying and holding mobile homes. If you're at that point where you need to build up cash, then you're going to either have to start out as a bird dog or a wholesaler and get to know some of the investors, the mobile home investors in your area so you can work with them to help them find deals. Go to your local real estate investment club, drive some of these mobile home parks, talk to the park manager, the owner, and ask them who are the people who are actually actively doing deals. You can actually call on some for sale by owner signs or for rent signs because many times those could be investors as well too. Now, other ways you can build up cash if you don't want to go that route, you can just save up your income every month if you have extra income, if you have a side business, a side hustle, because some people don't really want to be a bird dog or a wholesaler. They don't want to do that. But it is a good experience to do because it gives you less risk as a mobile home investor, and you actually get to learn the market better. Then you're getting paid for your time as well, too. If you do have the cash, then you're on the second path where I am ready to buy and hold mobile homes. So do you go out and just start looking for deals and motivated sellers? No, the first step is to actually learn your market. I know it's slow. I know it takes time, but you've got to learn your market. Find what parks we had talked about, the low end, middle of the road, and the high end parks. Find what parks you want to work. Do you want to work in low end parks, middle of the road parks, or high end parks? Once you know what types of communities and parks you want to work with, then you got to go in there, talk to the park manager, the owner, get to know them and see if you can work in that park. If they say, hey, yeah, you can work in this park, then then you get the go ahead to go out and find sellers in that park who want to sell their homes possibly to you. So as you can see, it's a process. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Doing your homework will help pay off. Well, I think those are really great tips. I want to ask you a couple of quick random questions I ask everybody. First off, what is one resource or tool that makes your life easier? One resource or tool that makes my life easier is my phone. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) In the beginning, I didn't do as much texting as I do now, but oh my goodness, I text all the time now because I'm really a like vocal person. I just kind of want to talk on the phone. I thought that'd be easier, but I start missing people. So if it's a park manager calls me or a park owner or these contractors or you want to submit a bid, I'm just like, just text it to me, send me pictures, especially when it comes to getting bids and estimates from contractors. They send me pictures. And then if I end up hiring them, they send me before pictures and after pictures. So I don't even have to be at the job site. They finish it. I pay them. And then I'll go out and check. It makes my life so much easier just to have my phone. Because, you know, back then you didn't have the pictures and texting wasn't as easy with a little flip. Yeah, (laughs) or look at pictures. Yeah, it's exactly. Oh, yeah, exactly. And the scrolling. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it is my phone that makes my life easier. What is your favorite book right now or your favorite book of all time? I think it's going to have to be The Richest Man in Babylon. Rich Dad, Poor Dad comes a close second, but The Richest Man in Babylon really taught me how to run a business and how to hire people, money management as well, too. So I really enjoyed The Richest Man in Babylon because as a business owner, you're constantly hiring people. And that was one of the forks in the road that I had a hard time like with contractors. It just takes practice, but you don't hire a bricklayer to put a roof on your house, (laughs) you know, and I learned that the hard way. So that probably is like my favorite book of all time, Richest Men in Babylon. 
We'll be sure to put a link to all of that you talked about in the show notes. Now it is time for my favorite part of the podcast, which is game time. It's game time. It's game time. Today, we are going to be playing brain teasers. I am going to give you four short but tricky brain teasers. And if you can get at least two of them right, you will get bragging rights that you won game time on the Military Money Show, which is a real big deal around here. Cool. (laughs) I'm ready. (laughs) All right. First up. Give me food and I will live. Give me water and I will die. What am I? Give me food and I will live. Give me water and I will die. I'm going to give you a little hint here. It's hot. That is a tough one. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's why I gave you the heat. It's hot. Very, 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 very hot. You can burn yourself on it. I honestly don't know. <laughs> now, it is a hard one. It is a hard one. This is a new one for the Military Money Show. It is fire. Ah, okay. 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 I was thinking of the sun, actually, but I oh, wasn't yeah, sure. Well, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good... That, that would have been a good second guess. <laughs> All right. The second one. What has a spine but no bones? What has a spine but no bones? Oh, my goodness. No, a skeleton has bones, so it cannot be a skeleton. Okay, but it has no bones. It's a thing. A book? Yes. Oh, goodness. It is a book. Okay, I'm lucky. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Okay, third one. A man pushes his car to a hotel and tells the owner he's bankrupt. Why? This has to do with real estate, so this is a good brain teaser, but it's a, a tough one. A man pushes his car to a hotel and tells the owner he's bankrupt. He pushes his car to a hotel. <laughs> These are hard. And he tells the owner he's bankrupt. Okay, so car, hotel. It's, it's good. It's really good, but it's hard to come up with the answer. Because I'm thinking if you're pushing your car to a hotel, you've got car problems. <laughs> and he's bankrupt. Yeah, brain teasers aren't me. I wouldn't be able to get these, so. We might just say one and you win. He has no money, I guess. I mean, I don't know. (laughs) Here's the answer. And it's, you'll get it when I say it. He's playing Monopoly. Oh my goodness. (laughs) Okay, that would never have gotten to my head. (laughs) It wouldn't have come to mind either, but I'm looking at the answer. So, okay, last one. In my hand, I have two coins that are newly minted together. They total 30 cents. This one's hard. I'm just going to go ahead and give you this one. (laughs) I'll let you try. My goodness. Math is not my forte, but. (laughs) Yes, basically, I'll read it for everybody and you can see if you get it at home. In my hand, I have two coins that are newly minted together. They total 30 cents. One isn't a nickel. What are the coins? And the answer is a quarter and a nickel. So those those were toughies, Rachel. So I you wow. just wow you win game time. You win game time. Oh. You got one of them right. <laughs> so I got bragging rights. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, thank you, thank you. Well, I appreciate you playing the game and being on the show. Can you tell everybody listening where they can learn more about you and what you're up to? Sure, no problem. They can go to my website, adventuresinmobilehomes.com to learn more about me. I do have the podcast, Adventures in Mobile Homes. There's a link there as well, too. And they can learn more about me and what I'm up to. Wonderful. We'll be sure to link to all of that in the show notes for everybody. Thank you, Rachel, for sharing all your knowledge. This was really awesome. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Lacey. Appreciate it. Thanks to Rachel for coming on the show to talk about investing in mobile homes. Thank you to Navy Federal for providing support to the Military Money Show. To learn more about their savings and investing options, you can visit them at NavyFederal.org. You can also head over to LaceyLingford.com to get all the show notes and the resources we talked about today. I appreciate you listening, and I will talk to you next week. The Military and Money community is coming together April 21st through the 23rd of 2022 for the first ever Mill Money Con. Join fellow military financial counselors, coaches, planners, educators, and influencers for the biggest gathering of the Military and Money community. 
You'll walk away from Mill Money Con with inspiration and actionable advice on hiring and business growth opportunities, ideas to improve your craft, getting connected within the community, and ways to increase your earning power. You can get your pass in the show notes to become part of Mill Money Con's community in 2022.